We're recording. Go ahead, Andy. Okay. Um, I'm going to call the Finance Committee to uh, meeting to order on May 10, 2022. Um, it's a few minutes after 9 a.m. And uh, so we're just about three minutes past our start time. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting is conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to peer, uh, access the meeting may do so by Zoom or by telephone. Uh, no in-person attendance of members of the public has uh, been permitted, but it, it, it is a Zoom to the Zoom meeting, but um, every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Um, so what we want to do um, is the uh, standard procedure is that I will go through members of the committee and uh, make sure that everybody can hear me and we can hear them. And then uh, trying to see if uh, you may need to call a meeting of the uh, council. Lynn, have you counted? Um, I only have Anna here. So right now oh. we don't have a quorum of the council. Okay. Keep an eye on it. And if we have to uh, right. alert me, if we have to pause the meeting in order to convene the right. meeting, um, as far as uh, honest, uh, you know, she can participate fully as is our practice. Um, but Anna, let me just mention, we're gonna do some other things first before we get to capital. So if you need to kind of focus while you're waiting, that's fine. Thank you. Um, okay, so let me go through the list. Uh, so uh, Lynn? Present. Uh, Bob Hegner? Present. Matt? Present. Um, Bernie? Present. Uh, Michelle? Here. Kathy? Here. And at this point, we haven't heard from Alicia. Um, so um, with that, I think we're on to uh, the next topic, which is uh, the agenda review part of it. And uh, what um, we were proposing to do for several different reasons is to um, do the third quarter report first and then go back and um, get into the other agenda items having to do with the FY23 budget. Do you want uh, me to pull the agenda up, Andy? No, I don't think that we'll need to. I think that what will be more important um, if we do this is to um, get the third, if we want to have a third quarter report on the screen. And I don't know if Sean's prepared to do that, if, um, what the plan is between Sean and Sonia. The reasons to do the uh, report first is that it might help inform the discussion of the FY23 budget to know how we're doing with the current year. So with that, um, if there's no objection from the committee, um, I will go ahead and ask Sonia and Sean to begin the presentation. I guess that's me, Sean. Okay. Um, Thanks for the opportunity to present the third quarter report to everybody. Um, the general, on the general fund side, we'll go through the revenues first. Uh, most of the revenues have already hit their budgeted amounts and others are just timing of when they will come in. But again, I wanna remind everybody, this is, a, this is revenues coming in in a much lower budget estimate than we normally have. It, it, can I just uh, pause you for just a moment, Sonia? Alicia Walker has joined the meeting. Andy, do you want to check that she can be heard? Yeah, hi. Alicia, um, welcome to the meeting. And uh, I do, do note that uh, it might be your birthday, according to Facebook. So, so happy birthday. 
Uh, can you hear? Yes, and um, thank you, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we just started, uh, um, and we um, are going with the third quarter report first because how we're doing with um, the current year um, has several ways that it might um, affect later discussions. Sonia had just started, so Sonia, back to you. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, the general fund, most revenues have already hit their budgeted amounts, but it's of a much lower budget than we normally have. Um, Cherry Hill is at, I just point out Cherry Hill is at 100.4% collected. However, this was a significantly reduced budget. Um, our, I'm just going to hit on a few of these. Investment income has done well. Licenses and permits have remained strong due to development or due to the development around town, if I can get it out. Um, hotel, mo other excise like hotel, motel, meals, tax are doing better than we anticipated. However, cannabis has dropped significantly. We're only at 50% collected to date. Um, we're at approximately 96,000 so far. And last year and the year before at this time, last year we were at 150 and um, the year before was about 160. So. And that's due to one of the establishments um, dropping off from recreational to medical. I'm not sure which one. I'm sure Sean can let you know that. Um, property tax and state aid are all where they should be. On the expense side, budgets are being hit pretty hard with a lot of these cost es escalations. So our budgets are really tight right now. The last quarter, we're gonna to need to watch them very carefully. And this is for all budgets, including, I mean, some have surplus in there because they've had vacancies and stuff in there, but a lot of the operating budgets themselves are, are being overspent, um, knowing that there's gonna be savings in the, op in the salary side. Just want to make that clear, <laughs> but this is this is also true of the enterprise funds on the expense side, um, and we don't we expect fuel and utility costs to go up. So we have three point nine payrolls left to do so far this final quarter. So we're we're watching all this and watching all the expense line items. Um, the revenues on the enterprise funds look, the percentages look really good at 75 and 70% expended. However, there are some large debt payments that haven't been made yet. Those are due in June. So once those go out, these percentages will change. Uh, transportation fund is a little behind, but better than last year. But again, it's a reduced budget. Um, again, cost escalations have affected the operating, the um, expense side of those budgets. Solid waste and transportation are tight, but they're doing, they're doing okay. I go too fast. <laughs> okay, um, that's it. That's my story. Okay, I'll have uh, two questions and then I'm gonna see, um, I, I will keep an eye out for hand, for people who raise hands for about other questions. The first question that I had was, uh, usually we have ended the year because of very careful budgeting at the beginning of the year, where we're cautious in uh, amounts that we budget both on revenue and expense, that we end the year with uh, uh, a surplus for the budget, which uh, then helps us uh, with our um, free cash balance and um, allows us to make transfers, including uh, last year to the reparations in addition to um, stabilization funds. Are we in a position this year where we might end up in a different situation than prior years? I don't think it'll be as good as last year um, for building up our reserves, but um, a lot of the, op like I said, a lot of the operating budgets are tight. So I don't know how that's gonna end up at, at this year. And we are gonna return some money. It just won't 
it won't be like it was last year. I forget what it was last year. It was quite a bit on the expense side. On the revenue side, we seem to be doing well. Like I said, a lot of them are already met. So there, there'll probably be some excess revenue for this year. Um, Sonia, can I add to that real quick? Sure. One other thing that you'll will be in this year that's unusual, um, and we talked about it when we were talking about the track and, and ways to fund the track is the regional assessment. Right. Um, that's normally zero variance on the expense side. Um, whatever you know, we budget the exact assessment and then we pay that assessment to the region because they um, exceeded their E and D last year. They're reducing our assessment this year by four hundred thousand. So we'll have a four hundred thousand dollar variance. Um, in our regional assessments. So that shows up on the expense side for us. Um, but just, just to point that out, that, that'll be an unusual item this year. Yeah, thanks for reminding me of that, Sean. Okay. Um, the second question I was gonna ask, and I'll hold, you don't have to answer this now, but I wanna make sure we get back to it, is about um, water sewer fund, whether there's anything that um, we should be considering in the report that you just presented about those two funds that we should be considering when we get to the rate discussion. Uh, but I do see that Lynn's hand is up and Michelle's hand is up. So I want to let other people ask questions and um, get back to that yeah. one. Uh, okay. Lynn? Uh, given that we have a quorum of the council president, I need to call the council to order and check to make sure that uh, Dorothy Pam, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you, Dorothy. And Anna already spoke. And so I'm going to assume she can hear us and we can hear her. Thank you. Did you have any questions or? No, that's what I needed to do. Okay, Michelle, uh, and I uh, turn it to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, the money that, so the money that's been allocated for our new departments, including CRESS and D, the, the Department of Equity and Inclusion, um, both for this fiscal year and for next year, I mean, those, those departments are going to take time to, to build and to grow. And so there's money set aside, but all of the money may not be spent because we haven't hired the people and all the other pieces haven't kicked in. So what will happen with that excess money that isn't spent? Does it just get rolled over or what happens with that? Um, it depends on um, where they are. If there's um, any encumbrances or contracts in place, that will carry over into the next year. However, anything that's not encumbered or already in a contract will close out to fund balance. So it will go, it will flow through fund balance and free cash. It's um, operating budgets are for one year only, unless there's commitments beyond that. Okay, yeah, I, I was just talking to a community member who sort of like alerted me to that, who said, you know, basically there's gonna be, there's money that's been allocated for these things, but we haven't made hires, there's, it's not mm -hmm. gonna be. So I just wanted to clarify where that money would go. Thank you. Yeah. And the other thing I'll just add to that is, so if there's a overage or a, a, a budget deficit in another area within that area, if there's savings in that line, it would go to offset that first. Um, so, you know, individual line items don't really flow to free cash. It's really the sum of everything that flows to free cash. Um, but you can see on this one I have on the screen, you can see the community responder program, um, yeah. the 170. There's no expenses because we've been able to charge um, use our the earmark that we receive, the DPH grant, um, and uh, a little bit of ARPA for anything we've needed so far. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is there a way to sort of get a better understanding of where you think we'll be at the end of the year with respect to these new line items and comparing them to what um, has been expended based on hirings and other expenses associated? Um, there is, but it won't be for a while. I mean, I just sent out the year end process letter to all the departments where they're going to have to tell me how many more electric bills they have to pay through the end of the year, you know, what their normal expenditures are, what outstanding we haven't, um, the way we do fuel or, uh, 
this public safety is, it, it all gets delivered to one place and it gets allocated out to all of the operating budgets that hasn't been done yet. So I would be really reaching, trying to do that. And I just wanna point out that free cash is not a real simple calculation. It isn't you know what turns back or the extra revenue. Um, it also takes into consideration um, accounts receivable. It's so I just want you to know it's not like one, two, three, here's our bottom line here. We sure. should go through the state there, you know, they'll hit us for little things or things we might not have missed. So I just want to remind everybody of that. It's not a simple. And, and one, one other thing um, in regards to the community responder program. So we do have expenses now, just so everyone knows this reports through March 31st. Um, so since that time we've hired a director um, and so they're, it's, there so, will be, there, yeah. so there have been some expenses and, and there will be future expenses depending on the timing of when they hire the other positions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, there's a whole process of uh, Department of Revenue has to certify the amount of our free cash so that we don't know and can't use free cash until it has been certified by DOR. It usually happens around November or so, but uh, you know, it's a slightly right. moving target. Yeah. yeah, I can guess in July at the end of the fiscal year, but it's not final until almost the second quarter. Lynn, your hand is up. So yeah, uh, just a comment on the um, marijuana. I, I also think we're starting to see the impact of neighboring towns having. Um, the stores right on our border, particularly Hadley. So that um, I don't think it's just because I think it's Rise that decided to go all medical. Uh, Paul may want to say more about that, but I would like to also use this opportunity for Sean and Sonia, who are the experts on this, to explain, to go beyond the issue of if there is excess in one part of the budget, how does is that dealt with? Is there a percentage that can be reallocated to other parts of the budget? Because I think at this point, because of the two extraordinary situations of the DEI and CRESS, we're looking at larger amounts that might be left over at the end of this year, but yet we have a budget in which increased costs uh, for everything from gasoline to whatever are eating up parts of our budget we hadn't anticipated. So that's my only comments, thank you. Well, I can say that um, even though we try to stay within a functional area, meaning general government, public safety, community and development, even though we, we try, we, we commit to staying within those guidelines and we pretty much do. Um, the operating budget is voted as one number. So which includes all of those functional areas. So we have that flexibility that if there's savings in um, health insurance under benefits or something, that that can kind of offset any negatives in other departments. I try not to move budgets there. So you get a clear picture of which operating budgets went under and which, which um, so you really kind of know, you'll see you'll have extra in benefits, but you'll see, I don't know, community development might be over 5,000. But bottom line, it won't go over what was voted. Is that clear? Yes. Um, you can't, on the enterprise funds, they're restricted to each enterprise funds, water and sewer are separate, and they have to be run like a business and they have their own free cash, which is called retained earnings. So that's, that's got to net out the same way within their enterprise funds. Um, you can't have any, ex the only legal expenditure deficit allowed is snow and ice. Anything else you have to raise on the next tax rate or provide for it before the tax rate is done. Did that? Yeah, and I just, for those, of you who were involved in town meeting in our prior form of government, we used to close out the year with a uh, in the fall town meeting 
making some transfers at times between functional areas that's not required in our uh, current form of government. So right. it's diff slightly different process since it's not appropriated by functional areas, appropriated by a whole. Paul? Yeah, I just wanted to note that all, we also have been very successful at getting grants for some of the, for the CREST program and others. And that's, we try to hit the grants first when we have expenses so that we get the reimbursement from the state. Um, so it, even though we budget at a certain level, it's not those, those, those programs aren't moving forward. We might be hitting the grants instead of the operating budgets. Thank you, Bernie. Just ask uh, Sonia to remind us of uh, any caps there might be on the amount of money that could be moved from one budget to another or one functional area to another? Um, I don't really know that right off the top of my head. We, I don't think we've ever had that problem, so I haven't really paid attention to it, but um, I can look I, that I up and find out. Yeah, I haven't Even done higher my homework. now. Yeah, I haven't done my homework, but back in the good old days, it was like 5%. I think, um, I think they were increased for some reason. I think I read that, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. At, at any rate, uh, folks should know that the Department of Revenue looks over all this stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, so there's a, a, a review of it that's done. And any mistakes are, are caught and, uh, and, and corrected. And we're fortunate to have skillful people doing this stuff. So we don't have those mistakes to be caught and corrected. Yeah, and you. just just adding to what Bernie said, in particular on the revenue side, it took a couple of years for me to, for this to sink in. Sonia was telling me this every year, but on the revenue side, um, they really look at what we're projecting for revenues in our budget. And if we project something that's higher than what we received the year before, we have to have a really, really good, strong argument for it. Otherwise they wanna see you build your budget based on what you received in the prior year. Um, so when we, so what we're proposing for FY23, a lot of that's based on what we've received and uh, what we either expect to receive this year or we received in past years. That's why it takes a little while for the budgets to kind of catch up because we're, you know, we're trying to be conservative in that way. Anything else in the way of questions from counselors or committee members? If not, um, is there anything that uh, you um, have observed in the water sewer um, enterprise fund report that you just presented that affect the rate or you think we should be considering during the rate setting discussion that will happen later? Yeah, so are you okay if I jump in on that one? Sure. So I think uh, looking at this report, um, the water fund is the one that's most concerning to me. I think the water fund, um, both funds are tight on expenses um, and, and some of that's just unique to this year, stuff that they're dealing with this year. But um, the revenue side and the water fund is a little um, more concerning to me that it's not coming back as quickly as we you know, anticipated it would, would come back. It's doing better than last year. Um, it's, it's not, it's not way behind, but I think it was what at 72% or 71% somewhere in that range. Um, you know, we were hoping it would come back, you know, beat our budget target and come back even faster. So I would just raise that flag as something that we'll continue to monitor is how quickly water consumption comes back. Um, it, it's really tied to the consumption. It's that the, the rate is whatever was voted, um, but the consumption drives that. Kathy? Um, with your caveat just now, Sean, we're voting on water and sewer rates for next year. Um, if it comes in a lot worse, have you already built that in to what we're looking at? Or does that mean we might have to do a correction at some point? Or are there enough reserves in the water fund that we wouldn't have to make an for, adjustment? For FY23? Yeah, just for There's FY23. Right, so there's enough there's enough reserves in that fund that you know we we might have to make a correction if consumption doesn't continue to come back um, to where we thought it would be, um, but we are also we're not bringing it back all the way to where it was prior to the pandemic either. We're still sort of doing an incremental step um, back to pre-pandemic levels. So so we are sort of hedging a little bit in terms of it going back to normal, um, and we have a, a reserve that we can uh, utilize like we had to last year. Um, if it doesn't get back to where our, the targets were projecting. But at some point, if you know, so last year we did use reserves quite a bit. Um, we, you know, we will want to be conscious of trying to build that reserve back up um, at some point in the near future. Um, 
if we do have to use it again. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, confirm that we're not, we, we do have the ability to, to adjust the, the, the rates, the water and sewer rates during the fiscal year, is that correct? Uh, we typically don't because of the um, sort of the, the way the billing works. Um, so we bill quarterly, we bill sections. Um, so to change it mid-year, I don't want to say it's impossible, but I, I don't have we ever done that, Sonia. And change, I think it would be really complex and confusing to the public if we were to change the rate. Um, it, that's why we usually do it on July 1st, because that's the, the start of the next cycle. Sure. Um, so again, I don't know if it's impossible, but it would be really difficult. And we also have some... Um, sort of, I don't know if they're legal commitments, but some promises to the university and colleges that we let them know what the rates are for their budget um, as well, which it's a big number for them. So basically it's very difficult to do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we have, to, we have to be thoughtful in terms of what rates we set mm -hmm. to make sure that there's enough play in the budget that we're not gonna run into problems, correct? Right. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Lynn? Yeah, if we're done with this, I believe it was stated that Sonia needed to leave with the quarterly um, budget or report. And if we're going to move on to water and sewer, then I have other questions. But are we done with what with the quarterly report? Um, I think that's up to everybody else. I think it's a good just uh, advisory for everybody who didn't wasn't here right at the beginning the reason that we're doing the order that we're doing is that uh sonia is time limited and so she has to leave and if you have any questions that you think you might want to ask later about uh the quarterly report and you want to ask the expert this is the opportunity i just want to remind everybody that these quarterly reports get posted on the accounting website and there's a lot of information there. I, I tend to send people there all the time and they're asking me questions because they're pretty much answered in, the, in this report. And then the draft report that I'll write for the um, meeting on Monday of the council, I will do a brief report about the uh, quarterly report and what in our discussion that was just held and um, we'll include the report in the packet for the council meeting. Okay. So with that, um, I think we can go on and uh, I don't know if we want to do rates or want to put them off and go ahead and work on the FY23 budget. In a way, because of other counselors who are probably here more for the budget discussion and the um, Maybe we should uh, get back to the uh, budget general questions and uh, capital. So, is there any objection to going to that before and then coming back to rates? Seeing none. Um, so, getting to what the agenda was, the way that it was phrased as that we were going to, um, item number two is FY23 budget review to allow just an overall uh, questions and discussion about the overall budget. Put that in again, just because um, it's still a new document to everybody. Um, if it's, it's um, department specific, try and hold that to the department. And then we want to get back to the capital improvement programs. So I'll start by just saying, asking if whether there are any further general questions about the budget, uh, Bernie. Um, well, and not questions as much as, as some some commentary. Um, I, I really uh, the budget document itself, the way it's constructed, the way things are explained, is um, outstanding. And I think the GFOA guidelines were more than met. Um, it's tough to be enthusiastic about um, something is like a budget document, but being a sort of Muni fan, I really enjoyed uh, going through it. And 
not that I'm good on that question, Steph, but uh, I, I just think the way it's presented is, is uh, really meritorious. So thank you to all who worked on that. Um, <clears throat> and as we go into the budget, I just wanted to make a couple of observations with a couple, a couple of quotes. Um, you, know, you know, David Plouffe, who's uh, one of Obama's uh, uh, campaign managers and, and counselors, uh, did a lot of municipal work, and he used to advise people who were running for mayor or council um, that you can be as visionary as you want, but remember, you've got to pick up the trash and fill the potholes. And I think that's something we really need to keep in mind as we go through this document and go through our discussions. We got to make sure the basics are covered because those benefit every single person in Amherst and their expectations about that. Um, some of the stuff is pretty prosaic, but people do expect to have those services. Um, the other quote is from, I'll attribute to Stan Rosenberg. Uh, Politics is a lot more fun when you have money to spend. Um, as we look forward, we're not going to have a lot of money to spend. We're going to have a lot of need, but not necessarily a lot of money. So um, this will probably not be fun, but um, you know we're going to have to go through it and, and go through it uh, thoroughly. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bernie. That was helpful. Um, as a reminder, Alan. Bob has his hand up before me. Here, Bob. All right, thanks. Um, Sean, it, it would be helpful. I, I've been looking through the budget and especially on the, the, the page 46, the, the revenue expenditure summary and the long range financial outlook. And, and I can't see the recovery funds, the ARPA and the ESSER funds in there. And can you tell me what line item they're in and how I can tell, I'm, I'm concerned about not only how much of our budget this year is through those funds, but as we go, especially on page 48 and 49, the long range outlook, as those funds get used, you know, wh where does that show up in the budget? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Before I answer that real quickly, I just want to confirm, did everybody get their budget book that wanted one? Um, I know they were going out for delivery uh, yesterday. I don't think finance committee members got them yet, but Angela's working on it. Okay, great. Um, so ARPA is not in there at all. So this is this is just general fund. Um, ARPA is, we treat that like a grant. So that's a separate fund. Um, okay. We did put a separate section below explaining what ARPA uh, kind of outlining the ARPA uses, but I get your, um, you know, your larger point, it would be helpful to have a sense of what are we funding from ARPA that's ongoing and what, what is the plan for phasing that back in. So I can, I can put something together for maybe by the time we get to the kind of recap that I can share with everybody that show, shows what that is. I mean, the, the major thing that we um, have committed to are the four firefighter positions um, that we're funding those from ARPA. We're going to do that for the next couple of years. And then I think it's FY25 or FY26 that we would fold them back into the operating budget. Um, we would have to do that within our, whatever the operating budget guidance is for that year. So, so it would stick to what's being shown here unless the, the guidance is higher that year. Um, but I, I get why that would be helpful. So I'll put that together. Thank you. Lynn? A couple things. First of all, Andy, I think it would be useful at this time to just remind people of what the charter allows us to do with the budget and what it doesn't allow us to do with the budget. Uh, because um, some people are new to the council and even those of us that have been on the council need to be reminded annually about how we have to look at a budget. Uh, the second thing is I had an opportunity yesterday to attend a hearing. Um, it was basically on essentially ARPA spending. In this case, I was particularly there because of the centennial hearing. But I'm hearing people on um, from other cities and towns uh, and associations sound an alarm about getting your ARPA money committed and spent down because of concern of the flip in the House and Senate um, and the possibility that they might start recalling money that's not spent. The other thing I observe is that as much as we have made commitments way back in the fall regarding our ARPA funds, if we really look at how much we've spent 
I think it would be useful to understand how fast are we spending it down. So it, it may be just an, a, a warning to the town and to all of us that as we look at the town's needs, and I do mean the town's needs, um, that we look at, you know, looking at that balance we have left in ARPA and deciding where we're going to commit it sooner rather than later so that we're not sitting um, on money two years from now that's still not spent. Yeah. My only comments. Thank you. Can I add to that, um, Andy? Yes. Um, so we've got about nine and a half, 10 million of uh, the ARPA fund sort of committed. It's not gonna be spent within the next year. Some of the, um, large parts of the commitments are for affordable housing or for homelessness, things that, um, you know, we're moving as quickly as we can on them, but they just take time to, to use those types of funds. Um, but we do have some funds that are not committed for anything at this point. Um, part of that was to see how this budget year ended um, as potentially we, we did this a little bit last year. If, if our enterprise funds had deficits, if we had general fund deficits, um, we could potentially backfill it with ARPA. That's one of the allowable uses. Um, and so we're still kind of waiting to see how that goes. And then the other thing we were kind of holding it for is just to see how Centennial played out as well. That was one big project that we, you know, we knew there were going to be some concerns with. Um, I think you've all received some of the um, positive news. You know, I don't want to say it's definite, but uh, uh, optimistic uh, outcomes around some potential grant funds and the state house revolving fund program um, that will help get the Centennial project back in line. So, so it's possible we may not need to use ARPA for that, um, which would be would be great. Um, so I get your other, I think the plan all along was if we don't need that money for Centennial or for some other um, deficit, that this fall, we would be looking to conduct another process to allocate the remaining funds, um, whatever hasn't been committed yet. Okay. So I'm going to be straightforward and say that I think the elementary school needs to be high on that list. Thank you. The school building project part of the elementary school. Um, that, the school building project. Thank you, Andy, for that clarification. Yeah. The uh, question I had for you, Lynn, is uh, when they were uh, when you were at this hearing yesterday, was the discussion about spending of ARPA funds and the fear that it might be reclaimed aimed at the state legislature's slowness about it committing its ARPA funds, or was it about local communities? It was all over the place. And I mean, at this hearing, I was there for a very narrow thing and everybody else that was there was for everything else out there. It was about a house bill. It was about the spending of the house bill. Uh, and it was to urge people to go ahead and have the legislature spend the money and not save it. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that because that is a big separate tension. You may be in hearing fact, that at MMA as well, Andy. Uh, yeah, I'm quite certain that I will. Uh, Michelle? Just following up on what Lynn said as a new person on this committee, what, as we're going through the budget, um, department by department, what is our role? Like, what do you expect from us, what, you know, if, if we if it if basically what you're saying is that we can only go down not up what what exactly are we are we doing in this dialogue um anyone yeah. willing to take that <laughs> i just i just want to understand so that i can come prepared and um and not waste anybody's time here really just try to understand what we're doing here um the charter and state law, which are tied together, um, because the charter was um, drafted consistent with uh, what state law for budgeting in cities um, is, uh, it's not a coincidence, specifically says that um, um, the chief executive mayor or the town manager presents a budget and uh, that um, the council, as it considers the budget, can um, reduce amounts in the budget, but cannot increase amounts in the budget 
with that one exception having to do with schools, which is a separate topic. And I had sent out some information about that earlier so that uh, people be aware that there is that exception uh, that's uh, incorporated both in our char charter and in state law. Uh, that is why um, I have been, since uh, we've had the council and uh, chair of the committee, um, trying to get the council to think about what it wants to say to the town manager about um, our um, wishes and guidance um, in December or January. So before the budget is developed, because after the budget is developed, we can only consider it according to the charter and state law provisions. And um, there um, was one exception um, and uh, that was um, when we were talking about the CREST program uh, um, that uh, we had some discussions and it, uh, some uh, additional adjustments, I think, were made at that point. But in gen that was a rare, um, I think, probably the only exception. And uh, so I think that's uh, probably the best I can do to respond to that. I think that it's very important that um, we understand what the cycle of the budget is and recognize that um, the guidelines um, have an important part because that's where we can say something. Once we're at this stage of the budget, it is very difficult um, to make the changes that are needed, um, both in a legal and in a practical sense. Kathy? Okay. Um, Andy, can I please ask a follow-up question to your response? Yes. Okay. Just from a process perspective, I, I don't understand why we wouldn't do this then earlier. Um, it, it feels like we are going through something that's already been developed. And what I'm hearing you say is that there's not really anything we can do except reduce although there was this exception for Crest to do that, um, which I think happened out of a dialogue that we had with the town manager um, and through the wishes of the council. So I guess I'm just trying to understand, is this genuinely a dialogue that we're having with the town manager and with Sean um, where there's flexibility? And if not, then why don't we go through all of these departments earlier when the guidelines are being developed um, so that meaningful conversation can happen about each of the departments. Andy, can I respond to that a little bit? Sure. Um, so, so just taking the step back in the process. So we do the financial indicators in November where we kind of give a forecast of what we're expecting. Um, we started holding the budget forum at that point uh, to allow sort of input before the budget gets developed um, to have the sort of dialogue I think that you're describing so that, that the town manager can hear that and the council can also, and also the council can hear that because it's before they develop the um, budget guidelines. All that dialogue gets rolled into whatever the goals are and the budget guidelines that go to the town manager and then we shape the budget or he develops a budget that meets the goals of the council and meets the, the budget guidelines. When we get to this process, I would say this is more about evaluating that budget document and how it meets those goals and how it meets those budget guidelines. Um, when you're hearing the when you're hearing from departments, it's so part of it's so that you can you can confidently say to the public you've reviewed every section of the budget um, that you've heard you've reviewed every department um, you've asked questions you've heard from them. Um, and you know one of the things you'll see in the budget document is you'll you know you'll be able to ask questions on it. If there's variances, you can dig into those and find out why there might be variances in certain departments. Um, you'll see where there's been additions, programmatic additions that um, like the for the Crest program or DEI. So we can talk talk about those. Uh, you'll see service levels. Sometimes that's you know I'd say a lot of questions around service levels to try to understand how how the activities of each department may be changing. Um, you know, there's some departments that are more interesting than others in that respect. Um, 
you know, police have interesting service levels. The fire department has interesting service levels because it's really tied to their their day to day. So I would say this process is more about understanding what's in the town manager's budget, you know, how it aligns with the goals of the of the council, how it aligns with the budget guidelines, um, and then and then hearing from the department so that you can confidently say you've you've reviewed every part of the budget. Thank you, Sean. That's really helpful. Yeah, I guess there's one other thing that I would to. Um, to Kathy, uh, recognize Kathy, but uh, in July, um, based upon prior experience and good practice, that's a good time immediately after the budget is adopted for the new year to look back on the process and what we thought about the process and what we would like to do going forward. And second piece to that is that this is the uh, we're a, a very important juncture in the history of the development of this process for Amherst, and that is that uh, the first council served for three years, and it was in a little bit of a different status because when it was developing its uh, guidelines um, for the year. Um, it had been through the process before, except for the very first year. And it was the select board that kind of uh, set the process up as opposed to the, the council. But, um, you know, we're, we, we developed something that in the first three years that um, was beginning to work well, but it needs adjustment because um, this is our first experience with new members of a council being elected, replacing people who are leaving the council and how that um, might be accommodated into the process. Also the fact that we're now going into two year cycles and no longer will have the three year, a three year council that will not happen again. What we foresee as um, best practices but I th really think that's a July discussion. At this point, we need to go on with uh, the budget review um, for now. So I guess that's the only thing I could add. Um, Kathy? Just, just a couple quick comments. Um, one I'll, I'll say on this topic, uh, we have, um, to respond to Michelle, we have, increasingly started thinking not just in the summer but through the fall and we put it in the budget guidelines um, having a discussion and also in the town manager goals to the extent we want shifts um, we make those known early because there's a lot of back and forth that then has to happen um, so trying to think through where those are because right now unless there's some magic we don't have any ability to increase our revenue and so the important thing is to keep thinking of what money do we have um, and where does it go? So just that's just a quick comment, but there's that, that lead in. The other is on Lynn's comment on anything we haven't literally committed to, even if we have as a line item, so maybe, I would like to think of for the school building, the elementary school building. And Sean, I just would like, if you can get some clarity on what we can use it for. We had at least one resident say they thought, um, she thought we could use it toward um, uh, design, you know, the design fees. And, um, so what we will, since we have to spend out thinking in terms of what, assuming the project keeps moving forward, what we will be needing to spend it for in 2023, and which of those expenses could be eligible the way the ARPA rules work, you know, and, and you know, the, all the components. So I'm not asking for an answer right now, but just to go over, Lynn, is what, what could be eligible so we, we can think in terms of um, what money is available and what it could be put toward as we try to think of how to pay for this project. That's yeah. it. Um, and I think um, just responding to that, the yeah, there's some categories that basically allow the town to use the funds the way, however we want. Um, the one thing I'll say is, and I, we can model this, maybe when we do an update, we can model what this looks like is, I don't know how satisfying the impact of 
um, let's say reducing the debt exclusion, if that's the way the town goes, of reducing the debt exclusion by a million dollars, um, when it's spread out over 25 or 30 years and over the whole tax base, um, I'm not, sh you know, when you see the impact of what that is, I'm not sure, you know, it'll be up to you to decide whether that's, um, yep. you know, worth it. Yeah, as, no, as, a, as opposed to using it for something else with a more immediate impact. No, abs absolutely. You know, um, so, you know, what doesn't have to be in the debt exclusion. So just that, that's just, if it's, if it's wide open, then we just need to look at the total dollars. Um, thanks. Bernie? I think we have to keep taking into account that perception is important here. Yep. And that if we can uh, reduce the uh, the impact of the school project by a million dollars, that may not mean much over 30 years or 20 years, but it will mean something immediately. Uh, and I've said this before about ARPA and other grant funds. Uh, when we get them, we really should be using them to put out fires and take care of immediate issues to put ourselves on a sounder basis rather than um, <clears throat> looking at, uh, um, at, you know, we have to do some, we have to keep our eyes open for prospects. Uh, in, in future needs. But I, I really think that this is an opportunity to take care of as much as we can, um, outstanding projects, outstanding expenses, and get ourselves on a firmer basis going forward so we can afford to build new programs. Okay, anything else on the budget generally? Otherwise, uh, we should turn over to the capital improvement plan. Sean, have you given thought as to how you want to present the discussion on the CIP? So I, I think we started it um, at the last meeting. I did the overview of the summary, um, and I did send out some uh, following follow-up documents about the um, the sorter and or the the library, not sorter, the library um, shelving and the ladder truck. So I don't know if if we just want to see if there's additional questions or um, if anyone's had further time to look at it and have other questions, happy to answer those. I can also bring it up if anybody wants to go through it again. Then. So I did take the opportunity to read uh, particularly the one about the ladder truck. And I, um, but I also, I'm trying to look around. Anna, are you the only one here from JCPC? Kathy, too. Uh, Kathy, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, so I'd like to hear from Kathy and Anna kind of the dis a little bit more of the recap of the discussion at JCPC on that item. I actually found the memo quite compelling, uh, particularly around the issue of being able to save lives as well as because the aerial is kind of taken care of but the ability to transport equipment higher and also save lives is very compelling, but I would appreciate some more on that. Thank you. I, but one way or the other, we need to buy a new truck. Thank you. Yeah, Anna, I don't know whether you wanna jump in on this. Um, Go ahead and then if there's anything, I, I'm sure you won't miss anything, but I'll add it at the end. <laughs> You know, this this got raised, Lynn, um, sort of midway through. We we had already agreed the need for the ladder truck. And then um, reading the Hampshire Gazette, it said Northampton was buying their ladder truck, new one, and the price difference came up. So that generated the memo. So we put it in, um, and you'll see the way we wrote up the JCPC report was it, it looked like this brought a lot more benefits to it. The reason we were paying more was what this uh, equipment could do for us. Um, it was more, more multi-use. So we, we left it, we basically left it to the town manager to talk more about it and make a decision. And so the decision um, is now to go for the full, you know, and I'll just say one more thing. Um, when, way back when at one of the council retreats, the issue was raised not by a current counselor that Europe, Europe does ladder trucks differently than we do. And it turns out it looks more like the Northampton ladder truck where it is basically a ladder. Um, you know, it can get you up and then the pumper truck comes along with it. And that it was a question of the, the trucks are smaller that way. They fit better down narrow streets. There were some reasons for different ways of approaching equipment. We didn't weigh in on any of this. Um, we really left it with uh, 
it made sense that it could do this lift, it could do some other things, and the, that the expense looked like there was a rationale rather than saying go for the one million. So, so Anna, does, is that where, I mean, we, we didn't really come down on a do one versus the other. It was more, there was a rationale. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think really they're, they're like Kathy said, that it was, it was a justifiable um, difference and that the, basically it's a platform versus a stick. Right. And so it's, um, it's safer for the firefighters to be on the platform. Um, it's, I believe uh, the hose runs all the way up so they don't have to carry it up with them. Um, and that was one of, one of the biggest difference in terms of speed to get to the fire in terms of, um, you know, the, the benefits for our firefighters were they felt were um, significant in that case. So I think, yes, we, we did choose to kind of leave that decision up to, to you all, which I'm, I apologize for doing that, but um, or, or, and with the town manager's input, but I think it was, we understood by the end why the, they wanted the platform versus the stick. Um, and, and they, we asked them about Northampton and I actually ran into um, one of them the other day and, and re-asked the question. Um, and they talked about how, you know, the, the differences in building size is one factor there. Um, while they can go, I believe they can go up to the same height. It's really the matter of safety for the, for the person fighting the fire and um, ease of getting equipment up. Um, there are some towns that have a preference for those stick, the stick ones um, versus the platform, like Boston um, apparently only ex like exclusively buys those from tradition, uh, but they didn't feel that was uh, helpful for us. And they felt that a platform would be more, um, would be safer and more effective for, for Amherst. So I wanna be very clear. I support the decision and I support the purchase of this having now looked at it for I think at least the last four years as a potential on the budget. Um, I do wanna ask, um, and I guess it would be uh, Sean and Paul, uh, I assume just as with the ambulance that once we actually go to order this, we may find that the cost escalates and you're gonna to have to come back for an additional appropriation. Would that be true? Uh, potentially, they, they try to uh, put a price out that was as up to date and based on a state contract. Um, so th there may be provisions in that state contract that allow price increases, but um, if you approve the budget, we have a cost escalation reserve in there. So, um, so that potentially could help. Um, but yeah, there's always that potential that the price could go up. Uh, just to, uh, the cost escalation reserve is an innovation this year um, that came out of JCPC when we were seeing what was happening to vehicles that had been, they thought ordered in July and now the price in February when we were looking at it was something different. Um, so the volatility of the prices in terms of upward. So that at least um, in our thinking was a one year effort in terms of FY23, and then we could look at it in the future. And we were able, you can see it in the write-up, we were able to fund that because uh, we're now regularly getting reports on previously appropriated money for capital that weren't wasn't needed. And the school said there's one that they could cancel out and we could repurpose. So it, there was, we didn't have to shift around a lot of capital lines to get to that. So I don't know, Sean, on how much you're thinking, I guess we'll know in FY24, whether we still need that or not, or are we back to something more normal that when you order something for a certain price, it actually is delivered at that price um, rather than at something higher. Yeah. So I had one other um, thing I did wanna bring up though, while my hand is up. We, we did not have a discussion and I, and I don't wanna have the discussion now, but I think we should at some point. Um, the inventory is a really good uh, practice that we've started doing. And we have what I would call surplus buildings listed. Um, literally one is surplus in that we're about to knock it down. The old Hitchcock Center, it's scheduled for demolition. <laughs> and so there, and, and so I have never heard a discussion on what is the planned use of that and should we keep carrying it on our books or should we sell it? Um, you know, on a, just on, it's an, a capital asset. And so we've got two in particular, the South Amherst School um, and the Hitchcock Center. 
And then South Amherst School is listed. If you look at inventory, we use it for storage. The thing I know that's up in North Amherst is the North Amherst School, which is partly used. It's rented out to a community service agency. It has Head Start, it has WIC. We also use it for storage. But I just think at some point it would be useful to have that discussion. Um, and I, I shouldn't use just the word surplus. Unused right now would be not in use. I would say the Hitchcock Center, once we knock it down, became surplus. Um, it's a genuine piece. So I just want to flag that because we did not discuss it other than note that those were on the list. And I'll lower my hand. Yeah, uh, Paul, did you have anything? I did. So the Hitchcock is actually, that building is actually on conservation land. So that is land that is owned, that is managed by the Conservation Commission. So it can't, we can't like sell the land or do anything like that because it's in conservation. The other buildings, we do have a property um, uh, surplus uh, committee that looks at these properties when we're prepared to do something with them. They have identified a parcel that the Affordable Housing Trust is looking at that's just a piece of land that the town owns in, in order to tr try and see if we can develop affordable housing on it uh, on Strong Street. Um, as far as the other buildings, you know, um, some of them we have inherited, you know, through either the school department giving us East Street School to school, and then that went through the process of making that, converting that into affordable housing, which we're in the process of doing now. Uh, we, the school department, they surplused the Southeast, the campus of the uh, Summit Academy, which is on South, on the South Common, and then they gave that building to us, and they still have all their stuff in it, quite honestly. Um, so we've inherited that in its current condition, the way that was maintained under the, the school department. So, and then uh, we just purchased Hickory Ridge, which is another building that we own. Um, there are very, there are not other buildings the town really owns oh, beyond no. that. But I think, you, you know, the idea, and this has come up before, um, is to A, inventory what we have and our facilities director is updating that inventory um, list that people I know has been shared with the finance committee that was done in 2016, I think. Um, it's, it's, it needs some significant investment of time into making that a, a usable document. Uh, and he has that on his agenda. He thinks it will take him a, a solid six months because it's a, an add-on project for him. Um, but he is going through building by building of all of our existing buildings to sort of assess the quality and to develop a real plan of action for us to maintain our buildings because that was one of the crit criticisms of us in terms of, of, you know, why don't we maintain our buildings? And I would argue that we do. We do a pretty good job on it. There's a huge amount of backlog in terms of what we have to invest in our buildings. And the buildings that are in the worst conditions are ones that we had not owned previously. Um, so, and like the Hitchcock Center was again given to the town after the Hitchcock Center moved. So, um, so I think that that's uh, um, you know, something I wanted to emphasize that we do have an, a large need in terms of maintaining our existing buildings. And we're trying to quantify that and we'll have that done during the course as we go through, through it. Um, so, and I think, you know, but the other thing we want to do and the, the select board actually had said, this is if we've got property that's not performing, let's get rid of it. Let's put it on the tax rolls. Let's sell it to somebody. Let's get it. Let's put some housing on it, do something with it. And we're also looking at any, they, you know, we have all these random pieces of property that we get by, for one reason or another that we can do that as well. Can I ask just one question on the, the soon to be knocked down Hitchcock Center? Mm -hmm. if, if conservation land had a building on it, in this case, it had one, has one, um, and then we knock it down, could there ever be a building on it again, or or is or is that it it inherited yeah. that building? So no. is, yeah, I think you can, yes, you can put buildings on it. It has to meet the uh, requirements of of supporting the the goals of conservation or something like that. Dave Zomek would know more about that, but I, we did talk about that. But it, it would require it, it to be supporting the mission of the conservation. However, we acquired that land. I'd have to. We'd have to look at how we acquired the land in the first place, too. Okay. You know, I don't. I won't stay with this. But it was just a. You know, I know the common school, which sits right next to it, had looked at it at one point and yep. and come to the same conclusion that the building itself didn't work, and yep. so um, they they moved away from it. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob. I just wanted to uh, say two things. One is I do support um, the uh, platform, a ladder truck. Um, I think in, in terms of 
the firefighter safety, I think that's very important and their flexibility in fighting fires. And also, as I recall looking at it, 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 it also has a pumper capability. And so it can operate independently, which, you know, God forbid we have multiple fires in the town at the same time, it might give, provide a lot of uh, flexibility to the fire department. Uh, so I do support that. Um, I, um, I also want to uh, just reiterate my concerns about the shelving in the library. I know it, in the grand scheme of things, it's not such a large amount, but, uh, and maybe we can talk about it more on Thursday, but it just seems to me that the, the town has invested a lot in the, the new library and these shelves are gonna be used in the new library. And that seems to me to be uh, the responsibility of the library to cover that cost uh, as part of their, uh, you know, their, their commitment to raise money for uh, the new library. Um, and I understand the importance of protecting um, the, the, um, the, the collections, the special collections, but I mean, it, it, again, the library has an endowment. They can protect the special collections if they so choose. And that's just my opinion. And um, you know, I, I will defer to JCPC if they want to fund it, but uh, I, I just don't see that the library, given all the other needs in the town, it seems like the library should be able to cover that cost. Thanks. Yeah, I don't know if anyone from JCPC or Paul. I know, um, I know Sharon, I think Bernie did send that as a question. Um, to Sharon to talk more about her capital request. So on Thursday, you'll get you'll be able to hear directly from Sharon on the shelving. Yeah, fair enough. Um, one other thing I just note to go back and then uh, to Dorothy, whose hand has been up, um, and that is that uh, Paul made reference to uh, a policy that was adopted when I was on the select board regarding disposition of excess property. And uh, what I'll try and do is uh, make sure I find a copy of that policy and um, then either, um, it's really up to Lynn as to whether it just be sent to the finance committee or sent to the council as a whole, but it is a policy that we in, as a council inherited from the select board. Um, Dorothy. Um, just wanted just to add a comment that um, town owned property is essential for any kind of affordable housing, uh, whether it's in Amherst or in Long Island City, New York, where they've done some beautiful work in terms of plazas to go with some of the new buildings. Um, I would like to just say that the um, property on Hickory Ridge um, would make wonderful uh, affordable senior housing. Um, Sunderland, Little Sunderland has got a new development of affordable senior housing, which looks very nice. And um, Amherst really could use that. That's it. Yeah, thank you, Dorothy. So getting back to the inventory, are there other questions that people have now? Lynn. Again, it's just a process statement. Uh, and that is that we don't vote the budget individually we vote it as one big recommendation. And we don't do that until after we get done with all of these meetings in May. So if we have questions now about a piece of equipment or whatever, but we're going to see the department later, we have an opportunity, as Andy mentioned, to bring that up, okay? Just, to, it's, a, it's a process statement, thank you. I guess I have a general question to Kathy and Anna, and that was uh, when you were going through the JCPC process, were there any particular items that, um, other than the fire truck, which we've already discussed, that you as a, as a committee had more discussion about that were more difficult for you and that would be helpful for us to know about your discussion on? Kathy, do you want me to, the only one that I, you go, yeah. Okay. 
the only thing that we really did have a, a decent amount of discussion on was Cherry Hill. Um, oh, well, no, there's two things. So Cherry Hill was one, and then the um, HR study was the other. Um, Kathy, am I missing? I'm missing one. Third, resident proposals. Oh, yes. So thank you. Um, that was like my whole thing. Uh, so the, you know, Cherry Hill, um, we were just talking about how we might be able to make sure Cherry Hill is, is self-sustaining profit wise and what that would look like um, if they can possibly lease equipment, things like that. Um, and that was something that I think Sean had, and I'll defer to Sean to have maybe a better memory than me, but um, you know, the, the recreation director could look into for future years. We're not necessarily suggesting major changes right now, but it was something that as we look down the road, we wanna make sure that we're being both equitable and accessible with Cherry Hill, especially given um, the relative inaccessibility of golf as a sport. Um, and we need to make sure that fees are covering the cost to maintain and run. We'd like fees to cover the cost to maintain and run Cherry Hill. So um, that's a larger discussion that we'd like to have in the future down the road. Um, the HR study and assessor study, we really, this was kind of the, the technicality one where we were questioning how those were capital. Um, and the reason why, the, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take a stab at this, Sean, and, and tell, me how, tell me if I mess it up. But the reason why we, we ultimately kept them in the capital is that they're not an every year expense. They're every once in a while, uh, I think every 10, they've only been done, I believe like every 10 years, and, they should probably be done more often than that, but to put them in operating would um, would require either unused funds every year because operating typically is a, an annual um, renewing budget versus kind of the once in a while capital expenditures. So we did keep them in there, but we what we talked about was potentially needing to expand our definition of capital to accommodate, accommodate things like an HR study or an assessor study. Um, and then the last thing was the resident requests. And so this was something that, uh, you know, prior to my time as a counselor, I was working with some, uh, some folks who are in district five um, to submit a resident capital request. And it really was given the runaround. Um, and so, and I'd like to think I have a decent understanding of some of the systems and structures. Um, and I still was, was bumped from place to place to place in terms of how to, like where it should go. Um, and ultimately it was not funded because it was not, determined to be a um, necessarily something that should come from JCPC. They, uh, the committee determined that should be coming from DPW. Um, and so really the issue with it uh, in the transportation advisory committee. And so the issue with it is that the TAC doesn't, they're advisory. They don't make um, ultimate decisions based on conversations with them. Um, and there was a lot of confusion about who had the kind of authority and responsibility to say yes to resident projects similar to the one that uh, was proposed this year. So what we agreed as a committee was to reconvene probably I think after, uh, definitely after budget season, probably later in the summer um, or into the fall to talk through the process for resident capital requests and make sure that they are going to the appropriate place and make sure that we're you know, doing right by, by our residents and, and not putting a form out there just for the sake of putting a form out there, but actually making it so that it's something that can be considered um, and can be ingrained in the process um, and make a difference. <clears throat> and if it can't, we need to rethink it um, and, and not put it in there if it's something that would never get passed. Uh, so those were the, yeah, Kathy, go ahead. No, to, to, Anna summarized perfectly the, the three issues and just on the golf, course, um, there were two pieces of equipment that were being proposed to be purchased. And those were withdrawn at, in favor of, can we find some repurposed equipment out there, you know, um, that's not brand new, given that a bunch of golf courses have actually closed, you know, where did, where did their equipment go? And it, it was both to say, should it operate self-sustaining, um, to take a look at that, and uh, what is the plan? You know, so, you know, to have a plan that are we committed to having the golf course? And just one of the points was made is the actual land is used all the time. It's a recreational area. So we, we also even discussed that instead of saying Cherry Hill golf course, it should say Cherry Hill 
a recreation area because signage was part of what the recreation area wanted to do. So it was a question of um, the use of that um, long term and to come back with a plan. And the recreation director is fabulous. And he said, absolutely, you know, that he knew this question was coming and he was going to come up with a, what's the vision. Um, I, I would say on the, we changed the, the definition of capital to fit with these studies. And it was also what Anna said, it's because they're often multi-year and the, that doesn't work well in an operating budget that they're not finished in the year they're started. And the last is the resident proposal. And we'd seen, JCPC had seen this earlier. We often get resident proposals that have to do with roads in some way, crosswalks, sidewalks, um, turning road, you know, doing some, and they get bumped around if they're not already on the DPW list or at the top of the TAC list, you know, and so it's, it's a, how do we handle them when residents think that they're coming directly to a committee for a decision and the committee's then deferring to something else? So that's, um, I think it's an ongoing issue and people, it, I think there's a high value to these resident proposal as a slot, you know, so I would, I think the council and the town would be wise to keep that as a way of literally having a participation element, but we need to figure out sort of the, what I think you had to do in CPAC, Anna, also is someone comes to you with a proposal and you have to give them guidance on where to go before you can think about it. Um, and we haven't been doing that with resident proposals. Those were the big issues, Andy, because the thing I said last week, I think last week or last time we met, is the staff has done such a fabulous job of bringing us a balanced or nearly balanced budget that we're not in, when we're looking at this, we're really looking at smaller items like the library shelving, um, Bob, on, rather than on a, how do we fill a $1 million deficit hole or $3 million deficit? You know, which of these deserving items do we uh, push away? So we um, went through it. And the one other innovation, and, and the JCPC report talks about this a little bit more than the town managers in terms of kudos to the town, is our facility manager has started to broaden the scope of the facility management. So taking on the fire state, uh, the fire department. So really what Paul just said, you know, what is the need? And so building that into an annual ask with a really careful thought of it's not, it's the town hall building, it's the, the, the police station. And the fire department talked about how helpful that was to them, that they didn't have to think of a piece of equipment versus repairing something in the building, that someone was worried about the building over on another side. And so that broadening of the scope of what he's looking at and then coming to us with a big package but the big package is very clearly outlined. This is what we're going to do with the money, I think is an innovation that's fabulous. And it's it's a credit to him and to all of you, I think, that you put that together. It was it, it made thinking about maintenance. Um, it, it puts the spotlight on maintenance and what are the specific. So Crocker Farm was in there. The school was in there. The North Amherst ex former school building, it was really in a eclectic, a big group of buildings that he went through the plans for each of them. And it was a really good thing that we're doing that, I think. Thank you. Dorothy? Um, I'm just going to speak as a uh, man in the street, woman in the street. I think the idea of having a study be part of a capital budget is very, very bad. Um, capital is uh, projects are supposed to be things that you can see, touch or feel or sell or repurpose. And uh, as far as you know, taxpayers in the town, whenever they see the prices of these studies, they're appalled and shocked. And I think if you make a study, a capital expense that, that it encourages them to be even more inflated in price. So I, I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Can I just add to that or not add to it, but respond to that, Andy? Um, yeah. So both of these studies, they will have to be bid out just on the price front. I just want to be clear that they'll have to be competitively procured. Um, you know, so there'll be, there'll be efforts to obtain the best price. And, and to, Dorothy, just these were very specific. The assessor needs to reassess houses and we can't put it in the operating budget. So we're in this week because they don't do it in just one year. 
they do a schedule of them. Um, and so they are one-time expenses, as Anna said, they're not, they're not a study to then go build a building, not a study to figure out um, what are we gonna do with the following. And so we, the town has traditionally done it this way because of the difficulty of doing it any other way. And, and we're legally required to do it for assessors. Um, they have to do it. So there's not a way of them carrying over the money. So they get half the work done, but then the, the rest of the work is the next year. We, we have this, an annual operating budget is 12 months. Um, capital can be spent over a couple of years. So it's, a, it's an odd way we treat what might otherwise be part of a department function that every five years they have to do something and we don't have a way of, of putting it into a budget that allows the work to get done and we're legally required to do it. So it, it's, we tried to write it that it's not all studies, it's not any study, it's these, it's a, a particular kind of study that's this one time required. Um, so I, I don't know whether that answers, but that was the issue we, we had, we mm -hmm. had a long discussion about this over m multiple meetings um, on a discomfort with something that is um, and and it and it it it's legally required. So it is this the way we budget operating is one year capital can mm -hmm. be more than one year. Yeah. Right. I just I just think we can figure a way of changing the rules to make it work. Uh, I'm saying this in terms of taxpayers, they would be appalled, and I think we have to think about that. Particularly uh, I, you know, this is not a new discussion, uh, and it's uh, Sean will uh, know better because he did the review uh, rewrite of the uh, document. But the financial management policies and objectives defines capital and what is included in capital, and I think that the definition of capital. Um, has always included um, something that's broad enough to encompass these studies because uh, it, it has been the way that we've traditionally approached it. Um, and uh, the only thing, other alternative would be to look for creation of a third category and whether other municipalities have any models to work from, um, I don't know. The answer to that question, uh, Lynn. Um, I can understand Dorothy's uh, concern and confusion. Sorry about that. I can't do anything. Uh, I I actually am glad we're both these studies are in here. I do urge us to find another way to refer to multiple year uh, items that are not capital. Uh, having said that, I'm particularly glad to see the human resource study in here. Uh, we are facing, as is every other employer, a change in what salaries are looking like. And for us to remain competitive, we need to look at human resources. This is something that I had urged, and I'm delighted to see it here. I, <laughs> I have to say tongue in cheek, those of you that have talked about getting Cherry Hill to be self-sustaining, uh, I feel like I'm. It, it's a broken record. Hopefully, we could get there. And thank you for trying to reemphasize that yet again. You could probably go back to town meetings 20 or 30 years ago when we first purchased Cherry Hill um, and have this same discussion. So, um, and then finally on the, with regard to the library shelves, like any other item that either goes into the library or goes into a school, an elementary school, Fort River and or, um, Wildwood at this time, I think we have to ask, can it be carried into the new school building and or is it something that has to be done in order to make this particular item work until we have a new building? Uh, I believe in the shelves, we've said that they can be moved to the new building and that that would be the plan, um, but thank you. Andy, can I respond to that real quick? Yes. Um, that's a great point, Lynn, and, and Kathy and I did ask, um, in particular, the schools, there was a computer uh, technology request, um, and I believe Mandy Joe was the one who asked at JCPC about, you know, for buying these and they're going to last five years, will they be able to go to the new school and the, and the designers and um, OPM have told us that they can, it'll, it'll help reduce what, 
when we look at the school project, they won't be buying tablets and laptops. Most likely they'll be buying more of the hardware that goes into the building itself. But because we have sort of a robust one-to-one -one program already for the most part, um, that, that, that won't have to come out of the school project, the school, the uh, Fort River and Wildwood project. Thank you, Bernie. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, the spirit of Larry Kelly is still moving among us for the annual uh, Cherry Hill make or break it golf course discussion. Um, <clears throat> having been through budget process in five towns um, yeah, and having faced umpteen questions about why did the uh, HR department budget suddenly spike up by 12%? Uh, I think it's better. It's obviously it's a classic case. This goes back to when I was in JCPC and, and in other communities. What do you do with one-time only studies? And how do you avoid, avoid the questions around encumbrances and everything else if you park them in an operating budget? Uh, and why the operating budget spikes and goes down? Uh, so it's, it's just, it, it, there's no, unless we have a separate budget section for one-time only projects, um, we're, we're, this is the best place to put it. Uh, my impression is that forty thousand dollars for a class comp uh, study for the town side of Amherst is a very modest sum of money. I would be surprised if we get. Um, I'll be pleasantly surprised if we get bids back that are uh, comprehensive within that dollar amount. Uh, in terms of the other pieces that have been out there, I, I'm very supportive of the, uh, the fire department's uh, uh, platform truck request. Um, years ago, I saw the current uh, platform truck in, in action, and it's an impressive piece of equipment. Um, and I, I, I trust that the fire department's made a good judgment. We have a very data-driven, uh, carefully planned uh, uh, crew, uh, crew that does some very careful planning there. Um, so too with the, uh, the library shelf. So I'm, I'm supportive of that uh, in terms of, of the capital budget. One thing that this discussion does suggest is that the town does need, and apparently we're, we're doing that, uh, Paul has, has, has launched that project, is we really need to, to, to uh, take a look at where our public property is, what purposes it's used for. We also need to do some planning around future needs. Um, it's something that towns in New England don't do well. Uh, we don't set aside, we set aside uh, property for conservation. We don't set aside property for future development, future use. So I think we need that. That's another, just one more thing to throw on the plate. Thanks. Okay, anything else on capital? Because where we're at is, um, I think the next step is that we have scheduled at, um, at a future date, um, is it a required public forum, I think on this one, on the capital improvement plan. And uh, then after that, um, we will see if there's any input that we'll want to consider. And uh, we usually just um, include the vote on the capital improvement plan at the end when we're doing the operating budgets because we want to hear from the uh, public forum before we um, vote a recommendation. Kathy? I have a question, Andy, not for now, but for when we vote. When we're voting, um, voting on FY23 is easy for me on capital. Voting on the five-year plan that is not balanced is less easy for me because I think we're over committing and we, um, we have penciled in right now, and I know Sean has no other recourse, we've penciled in a number, a number for an override, but we're drawing down on reserves. So I would just like to figure out how we handle that. Last year at this time, I think I voted against the capital plan, even though I was completely for the one year part of it. So uh, if we're voting on all five years versus one year is something I, I would just like to figure out when we get to that point. Um. I get over to Sean in a second just to get a response to that. Uh, I think we can make a decision at the time we vote as to whether we're going to take two votes or one. Uh, I don't think that there's anything that precludes us from 
splitting the motion, um, and that's up to the committee when it makes a motion, how a member of the committee chooses to frame it. So I'm not going to try and uh, get to the answer to that now. Um, and if there are questions that you want to raise about the five-year plan that you would like the committee to discuss now, then, um, you know, it, it's still, it, that's an appropriate part of today's discussion. Oh, well, I'll just say, because I, I said it, I, I think I said it last time, I'm concerned that we're full speed ahead on both the fire station and DPW. And that's what is the big draw in the out years because $35 million of capital comes online and you see a big jump up in debt with those. And we haven't had a discussion. Those are, those was no problem when everything worked um, when we had our four project discussion several years ago, but some things have changed. And we have not had the time, Andy, to re-examine um, those both financing assumptions um, and modeling. So I don't think it's something we can solve over the one month period that we have to look at this budget. I think it needs, it needs a council finance committee discussion. And I, my sense is we're not ready for it yet. So what uh, the finance director has done correctly is just carried forward what we had already, what we said last year and what we said the year before, you know, in terms of when, when these projects come online. Um, but we're competing for funds over a five-year period, um, and it's not fully financed right now. And that's, you know, the regional track is coming on too, but in any case, it's, that, that's my issue with it, and it's not a short discussion. So, no, and I'm not sure that it's going to be uh, resolved when we have to deal with the vote on what we're going to recommend on, on the capital improvement plan. Sean? Yeah, um, so my memory is a little fuzzy on this, but um, I, I know at the council level, you know, the council's acting on the FY23 proposal. Um, they get the whole program, but but they're the, the orders that will be in front of them will be to appropriate the funds for the FY23 proposal and to do debt authorizations um, for just the ladder truck and the Crocker Farm gym project. Um, there won't be any debt authorizations for any other building projects um, as part of the capital improvement program. So. Um, so I don't think, again, when you make your recommendation, if it's focused on the FY23, I don't think that commits you to anything beyond what's in that, um, what's in that. that that's that what I was going to. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, Lynn? Yeah. Uh, so this coming Monday at five o'clock, we do the operating budget hearing. Uh, on June 6th, we do the capital budget hearing. And then on the 13th is when we I want to make sure I'm right, Sean. Uh, on the 13th is when we, if we're ready as a council, we vote the budget, both operating and capital, just to give you some sense. Although as a finance committee, we tend to, we can, we have to conclude our deliberations by the end of May. Am I correct, Andy? Uh, I guess our date is either June 1st or June 2nd. I think it's 30 days after referral. It was referred on May 2nd. I think it will help me with the calendar at some future time. But, uh, yeah, I, I, the, uh, you know, we talked about uh, needing to do a revamp of the um, whole analysis regarding the building projects based upon all of the changes of information since the last review of it. And um, I think that there was, uh, in discussions that I've had, it seemed like that that was more likely to happen after we complete the work on the budget for FY23, um, just as a matter of staff capacity. Yes, I would say staff capacity and also um, 
we're trying to wait. We want to use the most up-to-date information that we have from the school project as well, which I think is the big, we have a range, but um, as much as we can get more precise information, I think would be better to include. So is there any further discussion on the part of the budget, this capital improvement plan for FY23 expenditures that was um, people want to raise now? And if not, then uh, we should get to the, uh, I was just looking, there's no, no attendees at the moment, so I'm not gonna deal with the public comment question right now um get to the water sewer rates so this there was a very specific proposal it has been uh presented um uh, i think there's a draft order if i'm correct yeah. Um, do you want me to pull it up or the memo or the orders? Um, I think it's up to the, uh, if the committee has any general questions now, otherwise um, we would be in a position, I think, of uh, voting as to whether we're recommending orders. But I want to make sure that um, we don't rush that discussion if there are other questions first. Uh, Bob? Yeah, I just wanted uh, to go over again the water rate, given that we have the uncertainty around where we're going to be at the end of the year. And just to, to Sean, if you could just let us know what kind of um, contingency is built into that, that would be helpful. Yeah, so I'm going to share my screen real quick. <clears throat> um, so this is the water summary. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple types of, or there's a couple areas where we've scaled back. Um, so originally for FY23, when we were starting to look at our usage, we were, we were going to go a little higher. We were going to, um, so this column right here versus total usage. Um, if you look at our history, we were in the 1.1 um, range, 1.8, 1.9 in that range. Um, sorry, 1.1 or 1.08. Um, and you know, when we talk to our uh, uh, DPW superintendent, there's a lot of construction going on in town, which will support higher consumption levels in the future between some of the developments at UMass, um, the developments they see going around downtown. Um, but even despite that, we decided to scale this number back for FY23 and the FY24 number. We were gonna go higher for FY23, but we brought this back to a, um, a lower level. Um, so this is these two FY23 and FY24 consumption. These are the areas we'll be monitoring very closely to see how we're doing and how we're um, uh, progressing through the year. And we'll be able to, the good thing about water and sewer billing is every month we can kind of compare to history. We have a nice um, summary chart of year over year um, by month uh, consumption. So we can get a sense very early on. Are we kind of back in line with prior years? Are we um, still a little bit behind? And what we've seen this year is we are getting closer to being back in line with pre-pandemic levels, but there's some areas where it's, it's not quite there. Um, so that's one area. Um, and then on the expense side, I'll just say, you know, we, we do have, uh, we have $560,000 for capital. If the expense budget was in trouble, we might um, look to scale some of that back if we had to. Um, some of that's to maintain the, the water system um, and to make improvements to the water system. Um, but if we were in a real bind, that would be one area we'd look at. Um, I think the last thing I'll say is one thing that's not baked into any of this is any changes to the water and sewer regulations. So if there were to be any changes that were to result in higher capital costs because the, the town assumed greater responsibility for um, repairing the infrastructure, that has not been factored in. Okay, and you can see our, and you can see our, sorry, one last thing, the, the reserve as of um, to start this year was 1.4 million. Right. Presumably any change in, in um, the regulations or what the, 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 the town is covering wouldn't, wouldn't take effect until FY24, correct? 
I think that's part of the discussion is the timeline. And I think that would be one thing, you know, we would advocate for is any changes would coincide with potentially a rate increase as well if it was gonna um, if it was gonna mean more costs. Okay. Okay, thanks. This has been very this is helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so we've gotten a couple different pieces of news regarding Centennial. Uh, I'd like if you could review that. Mm -hmm. Tell me if that's in here. And also, I know we're shovel ready, but have we actually gone out to bid? Yeah, um, so what's in here is what has been authorized by the council. So it's um, there's an $11 million uh, mm -hmm. sort of construction authorization, and then there was money prior to that, that was for design and engineering. Um, so only what's been authorized is in here in that current debt when you see the real big jump um, in FY24. Mm -hmm. um, so since those authorizations, we've, because of the same thing everyone's seen with other projects, cost escalation has driven that, um, those estimates up to, you know, we've heard between 17, 18, somewhere in that range, potentially um, 18 million. So we've been you know, as we've said in some of these memos in the past, we've been looking for alternative sources um, to try to get back down to what was authorized. Um, so one piece of information we just got very recently was that we're, we're in the queue for the, um, the uh, I'll probably get this one wrong. There's two, there's two state revolving funds. So I think we're in the clean drinking water um, one, which basically they finance it. And we were in that program for $14 million because at the time we applied for it, that's what the cost estimates were at. Um, so we're in that program at $14 million or we're in the queue for $14 million. Um, if that's successful and that proceeds as planned, um, that would finance that portion of the project um, at a very favorable interest rate, interest rates uh, better than what we would get on the open market right now. Um, and there potentially would also be some loan forgiveness um, in the range of 20% or so. Um, so. So that would go a long way towards closing the gap. And then the other piece of news that we received was that um, the governor uh, proposed a bill. And in that bill was um, funding, it must have been from a prior application, uh, Tom Andrew may know more about this, that, but we were in there for three and a half million or so for Centennial um, through the MassWorks program. And that's not, as far as I know, that's not approved yet. Um, it's just a bill. Um, but if that passes and that combine and, and we're allowed to use both programs, um, if that passes combined with this other program that we just, that we're in the queue for, we would be pretty close to being within the, the funding that's been authorized. Um, so those are both really promising and really, you know, kind of, um, I guess I would say good luck or good timing in terms of when this is all happening. Um, and then the, I think the last, your last question was, where are we in terms of construction? So now that we're in, so they're ready to bid it out potentially this summer or in the fall. Um, the plans are pretty close. Um, some of that timing may now depend on the programs that we're in and, and making sure that we're following whatever um, guidance they have in terms of when costs would start. Um, so we have to dig into that a little more, but um, they are, they are um, ready to bid it out this summer if we're, if we're ready with the funding. And just one added, added thing on the um, state revolving fund, which is the $14 million loan, because we are a housing choice community, which means that we've done our fair share of affordable housing and have complied with everything the state wants us to do on affordable housing, we get an added bonus in terms of the benefit from that, that program. Right. And that could mean, you know, that could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. I think it's a half percentage point off the interest rate. Um, so when you, you know, apply that to 10 or, or $15 million, whatever gets financed over 20 years, um, that adds up. So that's that's a, one of the benefits of um, the town valuing affordable housing. Mm -hmm. and, and do you see with the bid supply chain issues or do, we just don't know that yet? Supply chain issues in terms of the timing. Um, we know, we know the supply chain issues have already, that's why it's got up to 18 million. Um, we, I haven't heard that yet, um, there could be. Um, there's a lot of steel involved, there's a lot of concrete involved. Um, yeah, just, and, yeah. It, just to frame this, this is basically a big treatment plant with a building around it. It's, it's really just right. a barn that holds a, a lot of equipment. Right. Um, but we, we're we hearing early sentiment that the supply chain issues are sort of simmering down. Um, that the transportation issues are, are being resolved, they're being worked through the system. There's still a demand for copper in certain uh, 
products and, and especially if anything comes from China. So um, I think there will be cost escalation, but maybe not as dire as we had initially heard. Mm -hmm. Thank you for all that. Michelle? So I'm just clarifying that the email we received from Paul yesterday, um, funding for Centennial Water Treatment Facility is what Sean, or what was just being discussed. Okay. Yeah. And I, the way that I read that is that we had received the funding, but what I heard you say is that we're in some sort of pipeline for potentially receiving right. the funding. So there's two. So so that one, from all accounts, it seems like we're in. Um, so that one, I, we're more confident about that, that we're in the program. And so we're just follow. We're going to take their lead now going forward as to what our next steps are. Um, we have to submit an application with, with different um, pieces of information attached to it. Um, but that one we feel pretty good about. It's the other one that was in the um, governor's um, proposal of how to use some unexpended ARPA money and some other funding sources. Um, but that's really just a proposal and it would still have to uh, be approved and passed in order for the funding to come to us. That so, was the subject of the hearing that I was at yesterday. Yesterday, okay. So, and so if I just so we had put in a grant earlier, a little, some time ago, for a MassWorks grant for three point five million dollars, and then they sort of scooped that all up and said, "Hey, we can address all these things that we had in the queue, and we can throw throw them all in here." And then I think there's a debate over who gets to spend that money. Are they is the legislature going to actually act on it this year, or are they going to hold on it for another year, which would be problematic for us. And just to follow up, so if we do, if we are successful with that, does that impact what the, the proposal that you put forward? And if so, how, how does it impact it? So if we're successful in both of these, um, it will get us very close to sticking with the plan that you see in the, the memo, because again, this, that will get us back down to what was already authorized right now, the costs are coming in higher. So um, Either way, we will likely have to come back to the council to authorize more funds, um, similar to the way the school project was, where there's grants and you have to be self-authorized the full amount, um, subject to you know reducing it by grant uh, amounts received. We will likely have to come back to you all at some potentially in the near future to increase the authorization with the acknowledgement that we have these programs that would reduce the share of the um, the town share. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. But they, that would, in the macro sense, not affect the rate calculation. Right. right. Dorothy? Um, I need some help on the concept of loan forgiveness because why couldn't they just do it up front? Um, so it was, could you run me through how that works? Yeah, so that's that's an area where I'll have, I have to do more. So this is a new program to me. I don't know how often the town's, if the town's been in it in the near past. I don't think so. Um, my understanding, but it could be wrong, this is why I have to do some more research, is that the amount we end up paying back will be the reduced amount. So it's not like at the end, we, you know, we pay the full amount and at the end they just okay. cut off some years. I think the amount that they finance will ultimately be the lower amount, but don't quote me on that because we still have to dig into this a little bit more. Okay, thank you. Lynn? You're muted. Are we ready to have Sean put up the um, financial order. order? I think so. I mean, I just, um, Then I'm ready to make a motion. <laughs> okay. Um, could you put up the... Uh, and... Uh, Should okay. I go ahead, Andy? Yes. Okay. I recommend that... I recommend that the finance committee, I move that the finance committee recommend to the town council approval of order number FY23-10 and order setting of the water and sewer rates to be effective July 1, 2022. Is there a second? Game seconds. Okay, uh, so we have a motion that's been made and seconded. Had substantial discussion. Is there anything more to be said about the motion? If not, I'm going to proceed to a vote and uh, maybe I'll go in reverse alphabetical order just to do something different and uh, ask uh, for members of the committee to vote and uh, for members who, who are counselors and 
uh, non-voting members to indicate whether they support the motion. Um, so doing that, then I would start with Alicia. Yes. I'm a yes. Uh, Kathy? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Uh, Bernie? Support. Uh, Matt? Support. Uh, Bob? Support. Lynn? Aye. So we have a vote that's um, unanimous as from voting members five to zero and um, all three members supporting and the motion carries. And um, I believe that um, I once again take a quick look. We still have no attendees, so um, we can we don't have any public comment for today. Um, that brings us to announcements and next agenda. And I think we know what the next agenda is. I think the important thing is is to remember that um, if Sean's going to get any questions to uh, the, the schools or the library, that um, he needs to get that today. Um, otherwise, it really won't be helpful. Or, uh, so, um, yeah, and I've gotten a lot of, I've gotten uh, a couple sets of questions already. So, um, and I've, I've passed those along to, um, to department heads. Kathy? Yeah, I just have a question on schools. It was what I, before we went live, we don't have a budget to look at. We have one, one page. So Sean, if you could, if you could point me, if you just give me a link, I'll go yeah. and read whatever. You know, I've gotten a few emails describing yeah. things. Well, yeah. So, so we have just received that this morning and we'll get that posted up and share it with, okay. with the finance committee. Perfect. Thank you. Two, docu two documents you'll be getting. And so that'll be in our packet as well. So I don't have to go to sure. the budget page. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Paul, please share it with the full council. Sure. Thank you. Okay. So um, I don't think we, I think we've uh, taken care of everything on the agenda, unless there's anything that people want to raise or ask in general about the committee process. Otherwise, I think. Uh, We've uh, achieved our two-hour goal. Um, and we even said we would go longer if needed for these meetings. But um, anything else? If I don't see any hands go up, uh, we will. We will need all the time next week. Uh, <laughs> I'll say go, going forward, we will likely need all all three hours. Um, so, but I do want to uh, take advantage for everybody of uh, returning. So if I don't see any hands going up. Going once, going twice, I declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.